I see the Clintonistas have uh, celebrated their, their latest outrage on the White House lawn by receiving Yasser Arafat. And uh, I would have been much more impressed if they had tried him as a war criminal. I was very intrigued with Ariel Sharon's comments in the Jerusalem Post. This is the man who ordered the murders of the school children in Avim, Ma'alot, and Antwerp, of the 11 Jewish uh, athletes in Munich, of synagogue worshippers in Istanbul, of a child his pregnant mother in Aleph Menasha, and a mother and her children on the bus in Jericho. This is the man that ordered innocent Arabs in Nablus hung by their chins on butcher's hooks until they died. And uh, this is the guy by whose orders the bellies of pregnant Arab women were split open before the eyes of their husbands and the hands of Arab children were chopped off before their parents. This is the one that we are honoring in the White House. Another indication that in our world, in the world of American politics, we have disconnected character from destiny. You wonder, is this just a travesty or is it a tragedy? And one of the things my wife and I do lately is weep for Israel because the meddling of our government has assured war and, and increased carnage in Israel. The great tragedy of all of this, of course, is that the PLO isn't even representative of the terrorist pressures on Israel. These self-appointed uh, gangsters have little to do with the future in Israel. The Hamas was founded by uh, Sheikh Yassin in December of 87, just a few days after the Infada began. It emerged from two previous groups that he uh, founded, the Islamic Compound, the Islamic Aid Society. And although it's based in Syria, uh, it has strong links to the powerful Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan. But it gets most of its financial support from Iran. We'll be talking more about that later. The real point I'm trying to make is that there are many groups. The PLO is not the significant one. Uh, the Hamas is probably the most important one, but the Hezbollah continues to attack from South Lebanon. In the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, there's the Islamic Jihad, run by uh, Dr. Fadu Shkaki, who was born in the Faha uh, refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. While studying medicine in Egypt, he came under the influence of the Egyptian fundamentalist group, the al Gamaa al Islamiya. And uh, on it goes. The Hamas, the Hezbollah, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Abu Nidal organization, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Popular Struggle Front, the Abu Musa Group, the al Saika, the Kurdish Revolutionary Workers' Party, and on it goes. There's a list of about 30 of these if you follow our newsletter. And it's interesting that when President Clinton sent the 23 Tomahawk missiles into the Middle East to make his point about terrorism, he didn't name it against the PLO. There are now 30 schools training terrorists in the Sudan, funded by Iran. And my sources tell me that they're the best organized, best resourced uh, facilities of their kind. And as we watch the charade going on in the Middle East, we should ask ourselves, what is the PLO bringing to the table? And how will these self-appointed gangsters control their rivals? You see, all these terrorist groups are really entrepreneurs. They get their funding, mostly from Iran, by, the, by who has created the latest outrage. And that uh, allows competition among these groups and it also allows deniability to the sponsors. What commitments and guarantees did Israel gain in exchange for all this foolishness? And how will these uh, groups be policed to, assure, to prevent the bases now that we've established, that we, the United States, have established in Gaza and West Bank? And so our text for today is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. The action is just beginning in the Middle East. By our shenanigans, we've assured that there will be war, there will be tensions. And on the one hand, that's discouraging as you watch the passing parade. On the other hand, strange as it may sound to your ears this morning, we have good cause to get excited. Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, you might turn to that quickly. When I was at the Naval Academy, I learned a proverb that was an old proverb. You've probably all heard it if you've done any sailing. Red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Now I knew that was an old proverb. I had no idea it was even an old proverb in the days of our Lord. 
because he quotes it in Matthew 16, first few verses, to the Pharisees. He says in verse 2, When it is evening, ye say, It shall be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it shall be foul weather today, for the sky is red and overcast. Ye hypocrites, ye discern the face of the sky, but ye can ye not discern the signs of the times. Jesus held them accountable to know the times in which they lived from a biblical point of view. The angel Gabriel had told Daniel the precise day that the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah the King, was to present himself, and indeed he did on that very day. But he held them accountable to know that, as we learn from Luke 19. You and I have that same accountability. He expects us to understand the signs of the times in which we live. In fact, I think we can more appropriately call the days in which we live the times of the signs. The most interesting thing, probably the main thrust of our, the prophetic part of our ministry, is to highlight that every major theme of Bible prophecy, half a dozen of them, is climaxing before our very eyes. And uh, that is sort of what we're talking about this morning. And specifically, I thought we'd focus this morning on a topic that I think most Americans are not informed on, and yet it's essential. Because the real issue is not the PLO, the real issue is not Iraq, Iran, Syria, Egypt. The real issue is the spiritual force behind all these. And that's called Islam. Islam. We hear all this talk about a Palestinian state. That's one of the myths that's been successfully promoted through the propaganda that's uh, uh, been organized. There has been all along a Palestinian state that was originally set up and designed and still exists for the so-called Palestinians. It's the place called Jordan. Most of us probably have, unless you've studied history, have, any, have, have no real notion of how that even came about. The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan is a European creation of 1946. Prior to that, you might call this general area Moab and Gilead. And it was populated for thousands of years by unaffiliated Bedouin tribes. And as I speak of Bedouins, this raises another issue. And it's interesting as we watch the press, they keep talking about the Arabs. The Arabs this and the Arabs that. And the first thing you should understand is that nobody has any idea what an Arab is. So you can talk about... Iran, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Turkey, Libya. You haven't mentioned an Arab yet. You see, none of these are descendants of Ishmael, if that's what you mean. In fact, they're not even all descendants from the same son of Noah. Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. The Egyptians are Hamites. The Turks are Japhites. Some of these are Shemites. They're all kinds. You say, well, gee, an Arab is a son of Ishmael. I don't think so. Are the Bedouins Arabs? I think so. Well, they're sons of Keturah, the third wife of Abraham, not even of Hagar, and thus not, certainly not of Ishmael. So it turns out when you start exploring this, it gets pretty murky as to what you mean by an Arab. In fact, most of the peoples I've just mentioned hate each other, let alone the Arabs. What does the press mean when they sloppily use this term Arab? What they really mean is a Muslim. These people have one thing in common, not ethnology, not, not their genealogies, they are united by a common hatred and commitment to destroy Israel. So we're really talking about Islam. In World War I, the British, the Allies, fought the Germans and the Ottoman Turks. And uh, out of the British war office came a major T.E. Lawrence, the Lawrence of Arabia that's so famed in literature. Although investigation will reveal that most of what's attributed to him was mostly public relations propaganda engineered by the, uh, the uh, British. But basically he was very active in organizing what is popularly called the Arab Revolt against the Turks. Of course, as you know, General Allenby was ultimately victorious in the Middle East. And as a result of this, the League of Nations awarded what's called the British Mandate on April 25th of 1920. And this was operative until May 14th of 1948. Back in about 1921, there was a son of Sharif Hussein of Mecca in Arabia. His son, an aggressive young man named Abdullah, moved in with his troops to that portion east of land, east of the Jordan, previously unaffiliated, Bedouins populated. 
As he moved in, a young British colonial secretary recognized Abdullah. It was in their political interest. They recognized Abdullah as the emir or chieftain of an area that they then started to call the Transjordan, that is the area across the Jordan. This young British colonial secretary's name happened to be Winston Churchill, who of course had a destiny a couple of decades later. Abdullah, of course, consolidates his control of, the, of his so-called British-trained Arab Legion. When we get to about 1946, Abdullah is crowned as the king of Transjordan, and his grandson Hussein, of course, is the current king. This Arab Legion, by the way, is the same Arab Legion that successfully fought the Haganah in the so-called uh, War of Independence of 1948. They made the mistake of joining Egypt in the Six-Day War against Israel, uh, through which, of course, they lost the, uh, the ground that is, uh, resulted from the Six-Day War. So Jordan is the Palestinian state. It was originally set up to be that way. There's a whole history I won't bore you with, but recognize as they, as they bellyache about a Palestinian state, there is one, always has been in recent years. But as we look at the Middle East and we watch the day-to-day -day press, let's keep in focus what God's plan is for the Middle East. His plan in the Middle East is to settle the Jewish people in a land called Israel, which includes, of course, Judea, Samaria, and an area called Ephraim. It is God's plan to give Jerusalem to Israel. It's God's plan to destroy Babylon completely. It's God's plan to judge Mount Seir and Edom. And it's God's plan to cause all the nations to know that it is God who brought Israel back. That's in Ezekiel 36, for those of you who may want to check that out. It's God's plan to have a spiritual revival among the Israeli people. It's also God's program to have Jerusalem become a cup of trembling to all the nations. As we examine the specifics of what God is up to, we, of course, in Jeremiah 16, verses uh, 14 to 15, speaks of calling his people out of the north parts, the uttermost parts of the north. And you and I, in the last few years, have had the opportunity to witness the direct fulfillment of that prophecy as the Jews have been allowed to leave the uttermost parts of the north, that is Russia, to uh, come back home. Zechariah 10 is also one of those references. Lebanon. <laughs> Lebanon is really, as you probably know, an extension of Syria. With all the other noise going on, with all our activity in, on behalf of Kuwait against Saddam Hussein, Syria quietly takes over Lebanon and no one gives a peep. But we know that from the scripture that Lebanon will possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath which is on the coast of Lebanon between Tyre and Sidon. You find that in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 20, Zechariah 10, 10, Zechariah 11, 1. We hear much about the Gaza Strip. Gaza, of course, is one of the five cities, the original five cities of the Philistines. And the Philistines, which really have a, basically an Egyptian origin, the Philistines were, of course, the traditional enemies of Israel. And the Greek word for the Philistines is the word from which the British decided to call that general area. Palestine. If you use the word Palestine, you're using a word that's been coined by Israel's enemies. If you use the term West Bank, you're using a term that's been coined by Israel's, you know, Israel's enemies. But the Gaza Strip is referred to in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 14, as the shoulder of the Philistines to the west. And it's also called the Philistine Lowland in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 19. And the Bible says that it will ultimately be possessed by Israel. You need to understand a little bit from Israel's point of view how they look at the United States, especially during the Bush administration, who backed Baker so extensively. It's widely known in Israel that Jim Baker leaked to the, to the PLO the names of the top three infiltrators, secret cover, undercover agents of the Mossad. And those three men were tortured the following week. They were tortured to death, and everybody in Israel knows it. So Baker is a four-letter word in Israel. Clinton sings a good song, but has guaranteed that there will be war in the Middle East. And if they give up any more land, it will deny Israel a conventional response. One of the implications of the so-called land for peace phrase is that if you restrict the land anymore, it will deny Israel conventional air operations, which forces them into a nuclear response. So that all gets very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. 
referring back to Jordan, the inhabitants of the Negev, that's the south, will possess the mountains of Esau. And that's Jordan, including Petra. And also includes Moab, which is southern Jordan and uh, northern Saudi Arabia, actually. Will yield to Israel, according to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 14. It's interesting that Moab and Eden also have the unique biblical distinction of eluding the grasp of the Antichrist. And according to Daniel 8, I believe it is. Now, you and I hear so much about the West Bank, called Judea and Samaria by Israel and the Bible. Judea, Samaria, and Ephraim will belong to Israel, according to Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5 through 8, and Obadiah chapter 1, verse 19. And then, of course, we have Gilead, which you and I would call the Golan Heights and so forth. It's southern Syria and northern Jordan. That belongs to Israel, according to Zechariah chapter 10, verse 10. Now, one of the things that we will be talking about this evening is a piece of background that I'm hoping you'll, those of you that can will join us because we're going to deal with the spiritual forces behind all of this. We're going to discover some interesting things. We're going to discover that Islam did not begin with Muhammad. You read all the history books, of course, and Islam grew up in the, emerged in the 7th century in Arabia, and that's a secular history. As you find out what Islam is really all about, where it really started, and what's really behind it, that may come as quite a surprise. You see, when God called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees in Genesis chapter 12, what was God calling him out of? I often uh, uh, stir up my Jewish friends by pointing out that God started Israel by calling a, a, a idol-worshipping Gentile out of the Ur of the Chaldees, and they get all upset. They can't deny that because it's, he's presumably, in their minds, at least the first Jew so obviously he was a Gentile prior, huh? So anyway, but I'm being a little flippant. But God, of course, calls Abraham, Genesis 12, out of, out of uh, the Ur of the Chaldees. It's kind of interesting to understand what the Ur of the Chaldees was really all about. The Ur of the Chaldees worshipped the moon god and a bunch of other idols. This moon god had as a symbol the crescent moon. He established, the, the, in effect, the lunar calendar. Uh, there was a black meteorite stone that was worshipped as the Kaaba. And the moon god was the lord of the Kaaba and the 360 other idols that were associated with it. The Kaaba was, the, uh, was under the custodianship of the Koresh tribe, which happens to be the tribe that ultimately Muhammad is born out of. But the, that, uh, the worship of, at Mecca of all of this generated caravan trade that was quite lucrative. It involved uh, a requirement that everybody pilgrimage there, run around it seven times, and then go to the Wadi Minna to throw rocks at the devil. All those traditions, of course, are still in Islam today. The moon god is worshipped in uh, Assyria as Sin. Strange name. Kind of the Holy Spirit does seem to do it, deal in puns, doesn't he? Sin is the moon god. Is a name, not the English word we use as sin. That's a different thing. Uh, sin, as an Assyrian word, refers to the moon god. Sin Necarib, uh, the king of Assyria, went sin multiplies its brothers. Moon, so it's a moon god phrase. This moon god when he, uh, in Arabia is called Ilah, Al-Ilah. And uh, Al-Ilah gets contracted to Allah. And the name Allah as the moon god predates Muhammad. If you want simple evidence of that, look at the names of Muhammad's father and uncle and relatives. They all have the name Allah in it. Allah was venerated as the moon god before Muhammad comes on the scene and converts this heathenism in, uh, into a monotheistic form of heathenism. But that, moon god, that uh, crescent moon adorns the mosques even to this day. And we'll have some surprises tonight. But the reason I'm giving a little preview of this because you and I notice that in the news quite a bit, there is a city called Jericho, right? And in the Hebrew, it's Beth Yara. Jericho is, Yara, is a derivative of Beth Yara. What does Beth Yara mean? What does the name Jericho mean? It means the house of the moon god. It's kind of interesting. So as we read about the Middle East and these terrorist groups and all that stuff, it's helpful to come in behind that and recognize the real forces behind these things. I'd like to take you this morning into one of the more spooky chapters in the Bible. I'd like you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. It's a strange chapter. It's really a prelude to chapters 11 and 12. And our interest this morning will not be in the content of these visions 
of 11 and 12 so much as the prelude, because we learn some strange, we get some strange insights from Daniel chapter 10 that you may find not only provocatively uh, you know, stimulating from a biblical point of view in terms of your study, but also you may find a very timely point of view. In chapter 10, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, the thing that was true, and the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and he un- and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning, or fasting, for three weeks, three, four weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came any flesh or wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And he goes on to explain all this, and he gets a visitor shows up. And I won't spend time this morning talking about the different views of who this visitor is. We'll just move on for our purposes. I, Daniel, uh, verse 7, saw the vision for the men that were with me, saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, and my, uh, unto my corruption I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words... Then was I in deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, and set me upon my knees upon the palms of my hand. He said to me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou thou didst send thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words." But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. And lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground and became dumb. And one, like the similitude of the sons of men, touched my lips and opened my mouth and spoke. And I said unto him who stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision of my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can a servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. And they came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man who strengthened me and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not. Peace unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. And he said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. And then said he, Knowest thou why I come unto thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. And then goes on chapter 11 and 12 which revealed some very remarkable visions which go beyond our time this morning. But the point I'd like to make is this is one of these strange, misty glimpses we have into the spirit world. Daniel sets about to fast and pray for three weeks. At the end of that time, he gets this strange visitor, an angelic visitor. Some scholars believe it's the Lord himself, others don't, and I won't get into that controversy here. It's not germane to our purpose. Clearly, this visitor is there sent to give Daniel a set of visions, chapters 11 and 12. But something very strange, he was dispatched to Daniel three weeks ago. In other words, he was dispatched when? When Daniel started fasting and praying. And for three weeks, Daniel fasted and prayed, and it took, for, for three weeks, this messenger was held up in combat by some dark force that here he calls the prince of Persia. In fact, he says that uh, he wasn't getting anywhere until he got some help. Michael the archangel helps him and he gets through and now he's in front of Daniel. Now the first question that the perceptive student asks, is there a link between this combat and Daniel's fasting and praying? Would he have gotten through if Daniel stopped his fast in 19 or 20 days rather than the full 21? We don't know. It doesn't say. Just interesting conjecture. You do get the impression that there's some linkage between Daniel's spiritual commitment and this messenger's commitment to come through and give him this vision. That's kind of interesting. But there's something else that sort of is painted here because this messenger in effect says to Daniel that I was held up for 21 days fighting with this character that we call the Prince of Persia. It doesn't mean the literal Prince of Persia. We're not talking about Cyrus or Darius. We're talking about the spiritual force behind that empire. And then he goes on, he says, in effect, I'm going to give you some visions, but when I'm through with you, I've got to go back and fight with this guy. But not only him, he says in verse 20, 
He says, uh, I return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I'm gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. So behind this prince of Persia, there's another demonic spiritual force he's got to contend with, the prince of Greece. Now, it's interesting that these names are obviously correlative to the empires, because uh, Daniel uh, is doing this during the reign of the Persian Empire. Daniel had a very unusual history. He was deported as a teenager as one of the hostages to assure loyalty. Uh, by Nebuchadnezzar, and so he's uh, departed to Babylon as a teenager, sent in postgraduate school, and of course rises to become almost like prime minister of Babylon under, under uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And late in, in his life, when he knows the 70, week, excuse me, the 70 years captivity are about up, he gets all kinds of interesting insights from Gabriel, and that's another story in Daniel 9. But the point is, he not only survives the Babylonian Empire, but when the Persians conquer Babylon, he rises to power in the Persian Empire. Very interesting career, this guy Daniel. It's one of the most interesting people in the Bible. But Daniel here is um, encountering the sort of climactic vision of his book. Vision of, uh, embodies 11, chapters 11 and 12. And yet we find that it comes at a cost. That this messenger, whoever he is, is um, hindered in combat by a demonic force called the Prince of Persia. And I think that's interesting background as we stand back now and take a good hard look at what's going on in the world today. Because we notice that the entire world, the entire world, is just about to be plunged into war again. And the triggering event, of course, will be the Middle East. The Bible has said that all along. In fact, in Zechariah, God points out that he's going to make Jerusalem a cup of trembling Around, to all the nations round about. And today, as we speak, in every capital in the world, the late lights burn as people wonder what to do about Jerusalem. No, there will not be peace in the Middle East. If you know anything about its background, you know it can't be. If you know your Bible prophecy, you know that will, there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace is there. And it will be a problem in the meantime. But also, as we look through the Middle East, we could spend a lot of time on all the different players there. Iran is led, of course, by Rafsanjani, and uh, he has declared what he likes to call his grand design, and that is to create an Islamic crescent from Indonesia to Mauritania. Indonesia in the Pacific numbers about 200 million Muslims, and swing that crescent all the way through Middle East to Mauritania and the Atlantic. And you're talking somewhere between a billion and a half to two billion followers. Rafsanjani has also announced that he believes they now have the resources. And by that he means not just the oil revenues, but nuclear weapons. To disconnect the Middle East to begin with, the planet Earth subsequently, from its Judeo-Christian world order. Rafsanjani, I personally know, has at least seven nuclear weapons. There's something kind of interesting about a nuclear weapon that most people don't realize. If you acquire a nuclear weapon, you're acquiring something that has a limited shelf life that comes as a shock to many people. A modern warhead, typically built by plutonium rather than uranium, but that's academic. We used to make them out of U-235. Uranium is normally U-238, but you can separate the isotope by any of five methods. And one of those is quite inexpensive and can be done in a garage these days and make uh, fissionable uranium for weapons. But the modern way today is to use plutonium, which is a byproduct of a breeder reactor. The effectiveness of a nuclear weapon is very delicately dependent upon its geometry, which changes because of the decay of short-lived isotopes. And if you go through the arithmetic here, you can also find that uh, you can find out what the shelf life is. Now, the, it's kind of interesting, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, about that the shelf life... See, by the way, you should understand, there's 29,000 Soviet warheads, many of which are finding their way to the black market. And Rafsanjani has purchased seven of those so far, that I know of, maybe more. You say, gee, if it's got a sh limited shelf life, that's kind of exciting. You see, if you're Rafsanjani of Iran, or Saddam Hussein of Iraq, or Assad of Syria or Daffy Gaddafi of Libya, and you acquire a nuclear weapon, you've got a problem. You either use it or lose it. 
Now, that, if you, that, that's the first insight. The next, thing, your next question is probably in your mind, Chuck. What is the shelf life of a production Soviet warhead? It used to be highly classified, but some friends in the Pentagon shipped me some documents which allow me now to, from the public domain that allow me to uh, tell you, frankly, that a, the, nucle- the Soviet warheads have a uh, shelf life of seven years. Every six, after six years, they are rotated for reprocessing. You can find that in the United States Naval Institute Proceedings of April 1992, or you can find it in Chapter 9 of Ezekiel 39, where Ezekiel tells you that. But we'll talk about that subsequently. Now, you'd also like to know is what is the age of the weapons that Robson Johnny has purchased? If they were new ones, he's got six years to play with them. But I don't know if they were new. I don't have that information. Things get much, might get much more exciting much, much sooner. As you look at the Middle East, we could spend a lot of time talking about all the different players, but the one to focus on is Iran. Do you remember all those warplanes that fled Iraq during the Persian Gulf War? Where are they today? In Iran. 115 of them. Rafsanjani has recently purchased from Yeltsin the spares to maintain the combat readiness of those 115 aircraft. And he has also bought another 110 including a a MiG-27s, 29s, 31s, and also at least a dozen, maybe two dozen, so-called backfire bombers, Tupolev 22s. But that's another interesting uh, enigma. As you start poking into the Tupolev 22, you discover it isn't the backfire bomber that NATO knows. It's called the Tupolev 22 M3, which has got nothing to do with a Tupolev 22 that you and I might know if you're in the military, because it's a totally different aircraft, swept wing, uh, 255,000 pound thrust engines, equivalent thrust of an Air Force B-1, which is a much heavier aircraft, has a c- high altitude combat radius of 1,370 miles, which puts not only Israel but Cairo and Istanbul within combat range of Iran. These are interesting aircraft. Top latest electronic warfare suites, etc., etc., etc. A couple of things you might be interested in. It carries the KH-22 air-to-surface missiles. These are 10,000-pound, 180-mile weapons with a 2,200-pound warhead Mach 3 impact. And they're fitted with anti-radiation acti- and active radar seekers. Uh, they're three times the size of any Western air-launched missile. They're specifically designed to hit a U.S. Navy carrier. Kind of exciting, kind of interesting. And I won't get into all the sensors and bore you with all the technical stuff, other than it's, it's getting exciting. The price tag of the spares and these new aircraft to, fit, uh, to maintain the old ones is interesting, $2.2 billion. It's interesting to have that kind of cash flow for your toys, isn't it? Iran has spent... $14 billion in the last three years upgrading its Air Force. That's kind of exciting. Now, the whole Middle Eastern theater, as you might, as some people seem to like to call it, strange term, is getting extremely sophisticated. Of course, now in this country, our response to that's rather interesting. We've decided it's peace in our time, so we've disbanded the Strategic Air Command. We've decided that there's no more missile threat, so that we've taken a savings of $3.8 billion on the Strategic Defense Initiative. Of course, we've spent that same money trying to build a ground-based system, which most experts feel is a Maginot Line, an, easily knock- an easy knockoff. France and Italy, who have opposed this sort of thing, are now building a missile defense to protect Europe from the Middle East, because it's getting pretty tense. Iran is doing something else that's kind of interesting. They're acquiring submarines. They now have five on order. Three, I believe, have been delivered. Russian submarines. They're diesel boats, not nuclear boats. You don't need range in the Persian Gulf. What do you use submarines for? Lots of things, but specifically I'm going to suggest mine laying. Persian Gulf is going to get exciting. But as you watch the Middle East, there's another thing you need to watch. How many of you noticed uh, changes in the Soviet Union in the last few years? Anyone? Okay. The Soviet Union consisted of 15 republics that embraced over 110 ethnic minorities. And, of course, most of us are watching the Russian Federation, which is the dominant one of these. We span four time zones. They span 11 time zones. That's quite an entity. And Moscow is, 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 has engineered uh, coup d'etats in 11 of the 15 republics, so they're returning under communist control as we watch. But that's another subject. The thing to watch as you watch the former Soviet Union, keep your eyes focused on what is called Central Asia, five republics. 
Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan, formerly called Kyrgyzia. These five republics have three things in common. One, they're Muslim. They represent 60 million Muslims. Two, they don't have the cash flow to feed their people. They've got problems. Turbulence. Three, they have nuclear weapons. Kazakhstan is the fourth largest nuclear power on the planet Earth. The primary space facilities of the Soviet Union were located in Kazakhstan. And they're not being cooperative, so Russia is shifting their, their uh, uh, space activities to the north. A little more expensive for payload, but keeps them out of that hassle. Now, Yeltsin's got a major problem to the south. In fact, he's got another major problem. Let's back up and talk about his strategic dilemma. As you imagine yourself in the Kremlin trying to figure out what you do now, you look to the west and you see a German-dominated European community emerging, stronger than ever. Problems, but strong. You look to the east and you see China and Japan getting chummy with each other. You're surrounded to the east and the west with your traditional enemies. You have no choice. You're not going to join an existing power base. That's not in the cards. You're a third world economy with a first rate military, three times the size of ours. We're responding to that by de-escalating ours. That makes sense, I guess. Um, So your strategy has to be to the south. We've been saying that for over a year, and those prognostications are not unique to us. Most intelligence agencies have been saying this all along, that the Russian Republic has to embrace Islam. One in three Russians are Islamic anyway, but the primary power base has to be to the south, and they have three choices. They can go with the moderates, that's Turkey and Egypt, but there's no gain there. There's lots of impediments to try uh, try to gain uh, access to the oil-rich but vulnerable states. That leaves them the logical choice of the radicals. Iran, Syria, Libya. And that's the way they're going. If you've read our recent newsletters, you know that Yeltsin is installing nuclear plants in Iran. Yeltsin has set up training facilities to train the Persians in nuclear technology. Yeltsin is also installing a nuclear research facility in Isfahan. Washington has been trying to stop this unsuccessfully. What really bothers me about all this, have you read about it in our press? See, one of the really disturbing aspects of our world today is the managed news. That's a mystery. But clearly the establishment is closed ranks in a way that is disturbing to American journalism in the sense that you and I find these things out by reading any foreign newspaper or uh, taking tracking any of the 300 intelligence sources that are publicly available. It's a little bothersome that you have to find these things out uh, secondhand, that our own news media is clearly blacked out on these things. But let me tell you the really exciting news. See, Yeltsin's problem is he does not want radical Islam, the Shiite leadership of Iran, messing around in Central Asia. His hands are full trying to manage that bunch, those five southern republics. So he sent his, um, his foreign minister, Andrei Kutsarev, has just completed an agreement with Iran. And based on the basic terms of it, and incidentally, he took with him his senior, Moscow's senior Muslim cleric, so that he would be represented by suitable Islamic credentials in the negotiation. What Russia gets out of this deal is that Iran agrees to keep their hands off Central Asia. What does Iran get in return? A military commitment of Russia to back Iran in any subsequent military operations. That's kind of interesting. What does that mean? Well, first of all, one thing it means is that Ezekiel 38 is in place and could happen at any moment, for those of you that know what I'm talking about. Something else, another dimension to this is kind of provocative. Iran, as we speak, is conducting training maneuvers. Their operating forces are training, running training exercises. And if you uh, remember, if you, any of you have seen, either read the book Patriot, uh, Patriot Games or saw the movie, you got a quick glimpse of what satellite reconnaissance can do today. That's not fanciful, it's real time. You literally can watch these operations in detail. What's interesting, of course, every intelligence agency on the planet Earth is watching all of this very closely. 
And as they watch these practices, they learn something rather strange. Because among the maneuvers they're practicing are amphibious operations under conditions of contamination. Now that's rather bizarre because Iran does not have to resort to amphibious operations to invade Israel. What on earth would she need amphibious operations for? It tips off what their strategy is. And their strategy includes, somewhere along the way, of the invasion of Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia, you may wonder, what on earth would the Muslims invade other Muslims for? Let's begin. It betrays our own lack of insight as to what Islam is all about. The radicals, of course, are the Shiites. Saudi Arabia are the Sunnis. In fact, they're on a slippery rock. There are at least three or four reasons why uh, Rafsanjani would want to invade Saudi Arabia. They're considered by the Islamic world to be turncoats. They gave their real estate to the West during the Persian Gulf. That's a no-no. They're considered too close to the West in general. But the most important reason is they control Mecca and Medina. And if Rafsanjani is going to be successful at creating his Islamic crescent, he's formed an axis with Syria toward that end, if he's going to be successful at that, he's got to control the holy sites, Mecca and Medina. So no wonder Saudi Arabia is nervous. No wonder we've spent 12 years secretly arming them. And all of this, by the way, is detailed in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. But um, as we go forward here and watch all of this, I want to remind you, for those of you who have done your homework on that famous battle in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that the lead ally of Magog, that is Russia, entering the Middle East is Iran, Persia. And as we observe the rise of Islam, not just militarily, but also in terms of its leadership position in, as a spokesman of radical Islam, so-called Islamic fundamentalism, as we hear Khomeini just recently, a few days ago, on Reuters, uh, as reported by Reuters, a call for a hammering in the Middle East to demonstrate to the world that the PLO does not speak for them, they're, they're unworthy compromisers. So this whole charade in Washington is just that, a travesty. I'd be more impressed if they had convicted him as a war criminal than celebrating him on the White House lawn, but that's another story. Let's turn, if you will, to Ezekiel, chapter 38. Some of this may be familiar to you. We've talked about it before, but we'll hopefully amplify a few of these things. Two of the most well-known chapters in the Bible, in the prophecy sense, are Ezekiel 38 and 39. In fact, many students are startled to discover there are other chapters in Ezekiel too. Um, let's just take the first few verses of Ezekiel 38 and then try to put this all in perspective. Ezekiel 38, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Cush and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its hordes, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters and all its hordes and the many peoples with thee. Be thou prepared... And prepare thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. And it continues. Famous passage. Famous passage. We encounter Gog of the land of Magog. By context, it's obviously the leader of the people of Magog. There's more that we've discovered about him, but uh, let's focus on the key player here. Magog. The first thing we notice as we plunge into these kinds of passages is we run into all these strange names, Magog and Gomer and Cush and Put and Tagarma and what have you. Have you ever wondered why the Bible uses such weird names? It's our fault. Yeah, we make it do that. You see, you and I, we keep changing the names of things. There was a, a city called Petrograd. And then after many years, it was called St. Petersburg. Then for many years, it was called Leningrad. Today, it's called St. Petersburg. What's it going to be called next year? Who knows? My friends in Russia tell me that in Russia, even the past is uncertain. There was a city called Byzantium that became the capital of the world. They called it Constantinople. Then it be, now it's called Istanbul, right? 
Here in this country, we had a place called Cape Canaveral. How many remember Cape Canaveral? Now it's called Cape Kennedy. Next year it'll be called Cape Hillary. Whatever. <laughs> we keep changing the names of things. But there's one thing we don't change the names of, and that's our ancestors. And so if you're Isaiah and you're called upon to speak of the Persian Empire a hundred years before it surfaces in history, how do you talk about it? You speak of it as Elam, the forebear of the Persians. You see, all of us in this room are relatives. We all come from Turkey, by the way. That may disturb you, but we are, you know. You see, we all came from Ararat. We're not only related to Adam, we're all descendants of Noah, right? Noah and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And it turns out that in Genesis chapter 10, there is a list of the descendants of Noah and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. There are 70 nations there listed in Genesis chapter 10. And that, because of that, that chapter is called by many scholars the Table of Nations. And those tribal names are very frequently the terms that the Bible uses to refer to the descendants of those peoples for the very reasons we've talked about. So the Bible frequently speaks of Mitzrayim rather than Egypt and so on. Now we won't go through all of those, obviously, but one of the sons of Japheth, one of the sons of Noah was Hamshem and Japheth, one of the sons of Japheth was a guy by the name of Magog. And it's very important for you and I today, in these days, to understand who Magog is, because much is said about Magog, and it's very, very relevant to you and I today to understand what the Bible means when it says Magog. Hal Lindsey and I, a couple of years ago, set about to do a research report on this, to nail it to the wall, because there is so much confusion about Magog and who he is. And there need not be, because it turns out to be a straw man. I mean, it's easy knockdown. The identity of Magog happens to be very well documented. There was a guy by the name of Hesiod, a Greek didactic poet that wrote in about the 7th century B.C., roughly about the time Ezekiel was writing. He identifies who the descendants of Magog were. Most of what we know about the descendants of Magog comes from the Greek historian Herodotus, who is known as the father of all history. And he wrote extensively about the descendants of Magog. He uses the Greek name, the Scythians. And by the way, if you really want a fascinating historical study, do a little homework on the Scythians. These guys were interesting characters. Uh, they happened to be one of the earliest peoples that developed an entire civilization on horseback. They were a nomadic, horseback-oriented group. And they also did something else that has never been equaled in history. And that was their skill at archery. When a child was born and could first hold a bow and arrow, they started teaching him archery. And they developed archery into a, to a level that has never been equaled since. The Parthians came close, but never equaled the Scythians. One of the trademark skills of a Scythian was his ability to bring down, while at a full gallop on horseback, he could bring down a bird in flight, even if it was behind him, right or left-handed. These guys were tough dudes. Strong bow took over five years to build a Scythian bow. They had a very short draw, short arrow, a very characteristic three-bladed bronze cast arrowhead that becomes their trademark also. They, their skill at archery and their barbaric method of warfare terrorized the southern steppes of Russia from the Ukraine all the way to China from about the 10th century to about the 4th century BC. In fact, the term Scythian is, shows up in the Epistle to the Colossians as an ultra-barbarian. It's kind of interesting when you read some of these things, uh, they, they find their kurgans, that is their tombs. The Soviet archaeological journals are full of all, they've made all kinds of discoveries about the, um, the Scythians. They, of course, are the ancestor of the true Russian. The tombs, you see, are in the, many of them are in Siberia and they're frozen, so they still have hair and skin and so forth. And so scientists can analyze the digestive tract, learn about their diet, and they know a great deal about the lifestyle of the Scythians. It always amuses me when you read these articles because there are certain periods of time where the Kurgans are missing. There aren't any tombs. And that's not a surprise. They were, they were cannibalistic. When they asked, invited you for dinner, you want to know exactly what they had in mind. They, uh, they, uh, when they conquered an enemy, they drink his blood from his skull and they use his skin to decorate their quivers. These were tough dudes. And, of course, as I say, they were a dominant militaristic people for a good part. In fact, how many of you have heard of the Great Wall of China? The ancient Muslim writers refer to that as the ramparts of Magog. See, it was designed to keep the Magogians out. 
These guys were tough dudes, and of course, uh, while the Soviet Union embraced 110 ethnic minorities in its 15 republics, the dominant ethnic population of the Russian Republic is the descendants, of course, of the Scythians, or Magog. It turns out, and I don't want to bore you all morning with background to that, Hal and I published a research report that has over 170 documented footnotes identifying the Magogians, so that's not a problem. Any co not competent observer understands who this passage is aimed at. But by the way, you don't have to know all this to figure out who it is, because you'll, if you read the passage later, you'll discover he always comes against Israel from the uttermost parts of the north. If you take a globe, put your finger on Israel, and go to the north, what do you find? Russia. So it's no big secret. But now, it's kind of interesting to uh, read on what happens here. Before we get into the, this, this invasion that occurs, and by the way, well, I'll come to that. Uh, this invasion also lists the allies that will be with Magog. Verse 5. Persia. Now, who's Persia today? Iran. You betcha. And we talked a lot about Iran previously. We'll talk a little bit more about it as we go here. Then in the Hebrew, it's the Cush and Put are with them. Now, Cush settled south of the second cataract of the Nile and thus becomes the ancestor to what in the, was the Roman province of Ethiopia. And that's why in many of your Bibles it's translated Ethiopia. But for, for connotative purposes, it really alludes in effect to black Africa. The, uh, the guy by the name of Put settled west of Egypt and therefore is usually translated Libya in your Bibles but he actually is the forebear of the Berbers and the other North Af African peoples, which are quite distinct, of course. But for your purpose in mind today, Cush and Put connotatively allude to Africa, but it moves on here, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its hordes. The Gomer was the ancestor of the Sumerians, settled at the Rhine and Danube valleys, and his history is well known also. The House of Tagarma. If you know any Armenians today, you know that they refer to themselves even to this day as the House of Tagarma. But that's a little narrow. Tagarma actually was the ancestor of the Turks and the Turkmenistanis, so it's a little broader than that. Now, what's interesting about this list of allies, we have here portrayed, apparently, the descendants of the Russians, along with this group of nations, are going to invade Israel, it'll turn out. But that's not all, by the way. Let me just pause here to amplify something else. You need to understand Islam. That's what we'll be talking about tonight. But also, Islam divides the universe into two groups. Dar al-Islam, that is the domain of the faithful, to Islam. And Dar al-Arab, that is the domain of those with whom we are at war until the judgment day. Their agenda is the Jew first, the Christians next. They teach their children what we would call a nursery rhyme. Today, Friday, tomorrow, Saturday, then Sunday. Friday is their holy day. Saturday is Shabbat, the Jewish holy day. Sunday is what we call the Lord's day. What's, what the, the implications of that little riddle is that First the Jews, then the Christians. Make no mistake about it. The goal of Islam is the subjugation of the planet Earth by the sword if necessary. In fact, that's what makes the passage in Ezekiel so famous. This passage that we're glimpsing at briefly this morning is perhaps one of the most famous passages of the Bible for two reasons. The first reason it's so well known is because this invasion is interrupted by God himself. God chooses this occasion to show his strength against the nations of the world on behalf of Israel. Not because they deserve it, he says. That's all in chapter 36. We won't get into that here. So one reason it's so famous is because it's that point at which God intervenes in human history in some very dramatic ways. The second reason it's so well known is because of the technology that the Holy Spirit puts before us in a passage that was written 2,650 years ago. But we're getting ahead of the story here. What happens, of course, in this passage is that this group of nations, interesting, verse 7 says, Be prepared, prepare thyself, thou and all thy company with thee, and be thou a guard unto them. The word guard in the Hebrew, the word in the Hebrew actually means not just a leader but a provider of materials who is not only leading these people, but is their provider of weapons. Today, Russia, in spades. If you follow our newsletter, you kept up to date on all the transactions, or most, the most relevant ones. Now what happens in the coming verses, and we won't take it verse by verse, is you'll discover that they're going to invade Israel. Verse 8 says, After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many peoples against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell securely. And don't be confused about that dwelling safely. The word in the Hebrew is batash, which appears 162 times in the Old Testament, but 130 of those times it means as a false sense of security. Security is a state of mind. Goes down verse 12. They come down and take a spoil. They turn their hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, upon the people that are gathered out of the nations who have gotten cattle and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land. Now, 
Isaiah chapter 11 verse 11 tells, God tells us that when he regathers them the second time, they'll never again be uprooted out of the land. The first time Israel was regathered was after the famous Babylonian captivity. The second time is not out of one nation, out of all nations. That's been going on dramatically in the last several decades. The formation of the state of Israel, 1948, being one of the major milestones. And of course we've watched Israel being regathered in the land. So we know that the timing for this is subsequent to what's just happened. That's interesting. We're not talking about a previously fulfilled historical event. Now, verse 15, When thou shalt come forth out of thy north parts, thou and many peoples with thee, all of them riding upon horses, and a great company riding a mighty army. Now, one other thing I'd like to point out, don't be naive about vocabulary. The word horse in the passage in the Hebrew is the word sus, which is actually means a leaper. It was used of horses, it's used of some other things. Jeremiah 8, 7, it's used of a bird. Exodus 14.9, it's used of a chariot rider. What do we call motorized infantry to this very day? Cavalry. Do they have any horses? I don't think so. They're like Hal Lindsey and I. We like our horses 300 at a time under a hood. You know? <laughs> Verse 16, Thou shalt come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land, and it shall be in the latter days. Very key phrase. And they shall come against my land. Not the land of the Palestinians. Not the land of even Israel. Whose land is it? It's God's. What a strange idea. Well, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Absolutely. But it's strange that the God of the universe has put his name on a particular piece of real estate on the planet earth. And that piece of real estate is the key to his whole relationship with Abraham. And the whole Old Testament cannot be extracted from his peculiar relationship with that particular parcel of ground. Very interesting. His land. Now what happens, of course, as you develop through all of this, is that there is an earthquake in verse 19. <laughs> and that day there should be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea, the fowls of the heavens, and the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountain shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. This, I don't know what it is on the Richter scale, but we're going to feel it over here. It's everywhere. There's a major, major thing. And of course, there's in the following verses in this chapter talk about hailstone and fire from the sky. God chooses the occasion to wipe out the field forces of these invading armies. A very dramatic event. As you know, I'm a Naval Academy graduate. And uh, in fact, I should mention some things that I don't normally mention, but they probably may be important for you to understand my perspective of this passage. I was a technical nut as a kid. Um, Radio ham when I was a nine, uh, nine years old. I flew an airplane as a teenager. I, uh, when other guys were hopping up cars in, in, in the garage, I was building a digital computer in my garage. I was a nerd from the beginning, I guess. Um, uh, I was heading for a PhD double at Stanford, except I got a Naval Academy appointment, and the glamour of that drew me, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it, it stretched my horizons. It gave me a passion for adventure that I've never lost. And I graduated with honors and took my commission in the Air Force because that was before the Air Academy started, and, and, and big, long story. I flew for a while, then I was in the missile program. I, I left the Air Force's branch chief of the Department of Guided Missiles. I was in the defense industry for a while. I've been, chair, I've been on 12 public boards, served as chairman and chief executive. Six of those, four of those were defense contractors. So I've made a good part of my executive career also was in what you and I would broadly call the defense establishment and for the intelligence agency. So that's, it's that background from which I hail. I should also point out, I've been doing this, what I'm doing now, for the last couple of years full time. But prior to this, for the last 30 years, I've been, in effect, a professional executive in international finance with high technology companies. My partner and I signed the largest joint venture with the former Soviet Union that's ever been signed. And we signed uh, uh, deals in Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, as well as Moscow, where the first Americans that were allowed into Salinograd, their Silicon Valley. So we have some firsthand experience in with the peoples we're talking about. But having said all that, let me point out some things. As you also know, for about 40 years I've made a study of Bible a hobby, and as you can imagine, as a professional military, I've always been interested in battles, especially, and with a biblical interest, I've been interested in biblical battles, as you can gather, both the historical ones and the ones that are prophesied. And I, I noticed something that's a little strange. All throughout the Bible, when there's a battle, A comes against B, there's a winner or a, you know, and a loser, and the story goes on. When Israel, it generally involves Israel, when Israel's in, in favor, she's in fellowship, she often wins under incredible odds, but there's a result and the story goes on. When Israel is not in favor, she often gets clobbered. But in all the cases, there's a winner and a loser and the narrative continues. It's strange 
that only in one case that I'm aware of in the Bible does the Holy Spirit bother to talk about the cleanup after the battle. And in this one case, you know, he talks about it, he spends an entire chapter, or practically a whole chapter, talking about the cleanup of this battle, namely Ezekiel 39. It's basically the cleanup of Ezekiel 38. Now, as you know, my peculiar views about the Scripture, that the, I believe that there's no number, no place, no place name, nothing in here that isn't by supernatural design. Why did the Holy Spirit spend virtually an entire chapter detailing the procedures that would be used cleaning up this battle? We won't go through it verse by verse. Oh, I want to mention a little bit more about vocabulary. I mentioned the horses and Seuss and all that business. Uh, I should also mention what the main battle tank of Israel is. It's called the Merkava, which means chariot. There's another passage in verse 3 of chapter 39 that's kind of interesting. I'll smite thy bow out of thy left hand and cause thy arrows to fall out of thy right hand. That's a nice quaint phrase, but there's a problem here. Uh, Katis and Kasheth are two Hebrew words. One means a sharp piercing missile. And if you're translating Hebrew into English for King James of England in the year 1611, you obviously know what a sharp piercing missile is. It's an arrow. What launches an arrow? A bow. If you were translating this passage today, you could justify a translation which would say, I will smite thy launchers out of thy left hand and cause thy missiles to fall out of thy right and not be stretching the passage. But we'll move on. Don't let the vocabulary trip you up. In fact, the Holy Spirit's gone to some amazing lengths to get through 2,600 years of linguistic traditions to get across to us what's really going on here. Notice verse 9. This is the cleanup after the battle. They that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn their weapons, both the shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, and the hand spikes and spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. So they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest. For they shall burn their weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. Kind of interesting. What does that essentially say? It says the weapons left over from the battle will supply all the energy needs of Israel for seven years. Now, if you read the ancient commentators, J. A. Sice, who published before the Civil War, and some of those guys, it's interesting. They all point this obviously has to be symbolic, because there's nothing that burns for seven years. And we read those commentaries today and sort of smile. What weapons technology could easily provide all the energy needs of the nation Israel for seven years? Nuclear, you betcha, absolutely. The Holy Spirit doesn't stop there. He goes on. Verse 11, And they shall come to pass in that day that I'll give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers or travelers, on the east of the sea. He's talking about the Dead Sea here, apparently. And it shall stop the noses of the travelers, and they shall they they bury Gog in his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Hamangog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them, that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to their renown in the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury, with the help of the passengers, those that remain upon the face of the land, to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they make their search. Kind of interesting. What is he saying here? Is that they'll wait seven months before entering the battle zone to clean it up. Then they send in professionals, men of continual employment. That's a King James way of saying what you and I would glibly call professionally trained people. Then they spend seven months cleaning up the land. And what do they do? They, the professionals take whatever they find, the bones they find, and they bury them east of the Dead Sea. Read that downwind. Okay? We're still not through because in verse 15 he says something further. He says in the passengers or travelers or the tourists that pass through the land, when they seeth a man's bone, then they shall set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. That's kind of interesting. In other words, after the professionals have spent their seven months, if someone on tour, going through one of our study tours through Israel, <laughs> sees a bone that the professionals has missed, he does not touch it. He marks the location and lets the professionals come and deal with that. Now, you find that procedure in verse 15 of Ezekiel 39, but you also find that procedure in Operator's Manual for Marking Set Contamination, Nuclear, Biological, Chemical, Technical Memorandum 3-9905-001-10, Headquarters, Department of the Army, United States Department of Defense. Kind of interesting. 2,650 years ago, Ezekiel was quite contemporary in his battlefield cleanup procedures. Now, 
Some of this may be familiar to you because I think we've been together and studied some of this before. Let's talk a little bit about an update on what's going on in the Middle East. <laughs> Magog, Russia, has a strategic dilemma. They look to the west, they're facing a German-dominated EC, and that is not a power base for them to join. Yeltsin's mission is to extract as much concession as he can from the west, from the United States and from Germany as he, as he can, and after that his days are numbered. State Department inside privately today will tell you that Yeltsin, they believe Yeltsin's days are numbered to keep an eye on Rutskoy as vice president, hardliner. Eleven of the 15 republics of the former Soviet Union have undergone in the last 12 months coup d'etats, forcible changes of government. Communism is back in charge. The Russian parliament have passed a law just recently requiring that foreign evangelists and ministers need to be registered with the government. No kidding. You mean the window? We always knew that the door was open for a while. It's about to slam shut. The reaction has begun. The key supports for Yeltsin, of course, are Arkady Volsky, the chairman of the Civic Union, and it's backed by a powerful industrial lobby, but then also Nikolai Ryabov is the deputy chairman of the Russian parliament. They're the real power brokers here. And so is the security minister, Viktor Abranikov, and the interior minister, Viktor Yeren. They're the guys that really are the kingmakers here. And, of course, defense minister, Pavel Grechev. And it's these guys that can call the shots. It's interesting that um, Yeltsin is very unpopular within Russia itself. Only 10 of the ethnic uh, uh, republics expressed support for Yeltsin in a recent refer referendum. And the, the most volatile part of, the Soviet, of, of Russia has voted against uh, President Yeltsin. You might also be interested to know that um, Yeltsin, though, has signed, just a few months ago, well, back up, Foreign Minister Andrei Kutsarev, taking with him the top Muslim cleric of Russia, went to Iran to sign a treaty. Now, you have to understand, as I started to explain, the dilemma that Russia has. If they look to the west, they've got a German-dominated EC. As they look to the east, they face China and Japan, traditional enemies, that are now joining together. That's the other big news. If you follow our strategic trends thing, you're up on this. The net of it is, is that Asia is about to explode. Uh, if you take the capital of Japan, is pulling its capital out of the West and shifting it to China. If you take the capital and technology of Japan, combine it with the labor and raw materials of China, you will spark the biggest economic boom the planet Earth has ever seen. Now, while all this is going on, let's stand back a little bit and see where we really are. If you look around and find the, the Strategic Air Command, you discover it ain't anymore. It's been disbanded. We're de you know, it's now peace in our time, so we're de-escalating our military. Peace in our time. There are now 11 countries with nuclear weapons, and they all hate each other. Peace in our time. We've got 22 countries, 22 third world countries, building intercontinental ballistic missiles. And what do we do? We cancel the Strategic Defense Initiative. The Heritage Foundation and other think tanks have pointed out the cheapest way to spot and deal with an intercontinental ballistic missile is from space. But we've taken a budget savings of $3.8 billion to cancel that, putting that money in a different kind of a program that is, the technical people say, has no chance of being anything but an easy knockoff. But I come from a submarine background, for some reasons I don't want to get into. Um, our primary deterrent in this country is the Ohio-class Trident submarine, 560 feet long, 48-foot beam, displays about 18,000 tons. Carries 24 tubes, each tube with a Trident D-5 missile, 5,000-mile range. A formidable weapon. The Soviet counterpart of this is the Typhoon class submarine. Also 560, well, 561 feet, long, one foot longer. It doesn't have a beam of 48 feet, it's got a beam of 72 feet. It doesn't displace 18,000 tons, it displaces 26,500 tons, more than most of the cruisers did in World War II. But the interesting about the Typhoon class submarine is that it's silent. That's why Tom Clancy got in such trouble with his first novel because he hit a sensitive nerve, but the typhoons are formidable weapons. They're actually designed to pierce through the Arctic fire and dive, and the, our sonar does not work in the Arctic. We can't find them when we do, so the typhoons are invisible. The Soviet Union had 63 ballistic missile submarines when it, it fell apart. You say, well, at least it's fallen apart. No, Russia has continued to build these every year since. Now, that's kind of exciting. We have 34 Trident submarines. They have 63 back in 1988, and they're still adding to that fleet. Each Typhoon-class submarine has 20 tubes. Each tube carries an SS-18 with 10 independently targeted warheads. 10 warheads per missile, 20 missiles. You've got 200 city capability in each Typhoon submarine. And you've got 64 on station. What do you need more for? 12,000 cities would be enough, you'd think. 
And yet at a cost of over a billion, almost $2 billion a piece, they keep building them. And with whose money, by the way? Guess. Kind of interesting stuff, because um, in the meantime, over the last 20 years, the Soviet Union has faced a fairly quiet adversary. We have faced a fairly noisy adversary. We've spent our research money on uh, acoustic anti-submarine warfare. The Soviet Union, not having that luxury because their enemy was rather quiet, they invested all their money in non-acoustic anti-submarine warfare techniques, and they made some breakthroughs. It's now the worst-kept secret in the defense establishment that two lasers of the right kind can track our tridents in real time from an aircraft or a satellite. And, what is, and they have this operationally. We don't. We're just still playing with it. Problem is, our tridents now are compromised. If you do have a conflict, they can be the first knockoff, which, which nullifies their deterrent value. The typhoons can't be knocked off because we don't know where they are. Kind of exciting. Kind of exciting. Now, there's another aspect about the typhoons that bother me as a militarist. If you buy an aircraft or a tank or a ship, it can be used for many things, offensively, defensively, and so forth. A ballistic missile submarine, it does not have multiple missions. It's designed for one purpose. That's a preemptive first strike. Ours are designed for that. Theirs are designed for that. And they're still building more of them while we de-escalate our military. Kind of exciting. Exciting times we live in. Now, I'm going to get into something this morning that I don't normally get into with an audience because many audiences are not equipped to handle what we're about to get into. But in fairness to you, I'd like to share with you some conjectures. Conjectures about verse 6 of chapter 39. In chapter 39, verse 6 of Ezekiel, there is a verse that causes the experts a great deal of concern. Because in verse 6, God says, I will send fire upon Magog and among those who dwell securely in the Ilya, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So a little hint. It's just a hint in this passage. But apparently Magog and his invading forces are going to get rained upon with hailstones of fire from the sky that's described previously. And uh, that that ends their ill-fated invasion. No problem. But there's a hint here. I will send fire upon Magog and among those who dwell securely in the Ilya. Now the word Ilya in the Hebrew is a problem word because we're not sure. It's not used very often, so we don't know what it really means. It comes from a root which implies a remote, pleasant island. That's why it's usually translated isles or coastlands. It could, in our par- parlance, also be a continent. We don't know. The, the term is, is um, a little, little foggy in terms of its precision. But apparently there are those that dwell remotely, securely, that are also going to get hit with hailstones of fire. And this causes the more alarmist of prophecy commentators to wonder, is it possible that the hailstones of fire that fall upon Magog may be the result of an exchange of nuclear devices. Is it possible that with this impending invasion that there's some brinksmanship? Unlike the brinksmanship that JFK used during the Cuban Missile Crisis, this one doesn't get handled as smoothly and ends up triggering the unthinkable. Very, very possible. Very, very possible. So I don't want you, as, as, as you study Ezekiel 38 39, to be blind to the fact there are at least some people that worry that this may imply a nuclear exchange. But, but if that's the case, there's a very interesting verse in verse 16. Because God, in speaking of this, says, And thou shalt come up against my people Israel. That is a strange verse. Those of you that are naive, or I should say uh, uh, early in your, in your biblical sophistication, could easily say, well, wait a minute, God always speaks of Israel as his people, my people Israel. No, that's not quite correct. It turns out that if you will read, don't take, we'll take the time now to tie this off, but if you read Hosea chapter 1 verse 9 to Hosea chapter 2 verse 23, you will find that there is a time, in fact, uh, God has Hosea name his children accordingly, Loami, they are not my people. And he tells them that there will be a time that Israel will be set aside and not my people. We'll probably talk more about that tonight because there's some very interesting insights from this. But in, 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 he, in God says, I will, in Hosea, he says, I will say to them that were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. In other words, biblically speaking, there's a time in which God sets Israel aside. That's when she rejected her Messiah. Jesus speaks of that in Luke 19. 
that they are blinded. For how long? Paul tells us in Romans 11.25, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Come in where? Ooh, that's an interesting phrase. So one of the interesting technicalities about this passage, if you really understand God's destiny for Israel, the fact that God is speaking here in this passage of my people Israel is a telltale phrase which tells you that this passage occurs when after the church has been completed. One of the things you and I need to be sensitive to is the distinction between the church and Israel. Many, uh, there's a lot of people very muddy on that, are very confused on that subject. God's, the origin, destiny, and inheritance of Israel and the origin, destiny of the church are quite distinct, quite different in Scripture. And you need to be cl- clear on that subject. The point is, is that this passage, I believe, is post-rapture. I happen to disagree with Hal. Hal places it typically within the 70th week of Daniel for a lot of other reasons I won't bore you with. I also believe it's going to occur prior to the 70th week of Daniel, but after the rapture. Hal and I both obviously agree on that point. That means something very interesting, my friends. Because on the one hand, we have an event that all the intelligence reports that I have access to indicate it could happen at any moment. On the one hand... On the other hand, it happens after the rapture of the church. And the way I love to summarize this, you're driving down the street and you notice all the stores are decorating for Christmas. And you know then that Thanksgiving isn't far away. <laughs> isn't that exciting? Well, let's, get, let's cut through it. What, what do we do about all of this? Well, the first thing, and the real reason, I'm hoping that you can join us this evening, because we'll, go into, we'll have time then to develop the background on some of these issues and show you the spiritual dimension of what's really going on. And there may be some real surprises in that material. But there's a more fundamental issue that I'd like to challenge you with, which is really the thrust of our ministry. And my suggestion to you, my emphatic suggestion to you, is it's time for you and I to do our homework. You need to find out about these things. You need to find out what the Bible says. We have here 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years that are now manifestly a single message system supernaturally engineered from outside our time domain that writes down history before it happens, history in advance. Strange idea, and yet we can watch it unfold as we speak. The Bible says that the city of Babylon, after many, many years, would reemerge literally on the banks of the Euphrates. For 20 years, Saddam Hussein has been spending hundreds of, million do- hundreds of millions of dollars to make that happen. Just like Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 15 and 51 uh, require. The Bible says that Israel would be regathered in the land. That's old news. It becomes a surprise to you. It happened on the very day, May 14th of 1948, that Ezekiel, in effect, predicted. The Bible predicts that Israel would also regain biblical Jerusalem, the old city. Old news. June 6th of 1967, as a result of the Six-Day War, they regained the old city. Again, incidentally, on the very day that seems to be implied by Ezekiel's prophecy. You say, gee, Chuck, yeah, that's pretty interesting, but that's old news. If that's all so clear, what's the next step in Israel? The Bible lays that out, too. Jesus, Paul, and John. Three times in the New Testament it's mentioned. The next step in Israel is the rebuilding of the temple. And they've prepared to begin. The Bible also says that while all this is going on, there's going to be a, an emergent European superstate that will dominate the planet Earth as a global government. That's been happening for 30 years. That's no surprise. We've given that background to you, I believe, in the past. We have a briefing package called Iron Mixed with Clay, the emergence of the European superstate. While all this is going on, Ezekiel tells us that there will be a Muslim invasion of Israel armed and led by Russia, reluctantly drawn into this mess. And God uses that occasion to intervene in human history. So what's the challenge here, my friends? The challenge is this. Acts 17.11, which has been my trademark for 20 years, Acts 17, verse 11, is where Luke tells you, don't believe a thing Chuck Mister tells you. But receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. What I urge you to do is find out not what Chuck Missler or some TV evangelist or whatever tells you. Find out what the Bible says about Babylon. Find out what the Bible says about Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple. Find out what the Bible says about Magog and the allies and the impending invasion in the Middle East. Find out what the Bible says about the European superstate 
that is emerging before our very eyes. And what you'll discover from all of this, it isn't one particular theme or some little proof text hidden away in some corner of the scripture. No. There are half a dozen major themes of Bible prophecy. And every one of them is manifestly being fulfilled before our very eyes. And Jesus challenged the people of his day and he challenges us to know the, times of the, know the signs of the times. And I frequently like to call our particular era the times of the signs. Because it's all happening as we speak. Exciting times. There's no more exciting time to be alive than right now. Because God is about to climax his dealing with mankind. Now, as we watch the passing parade, as we watch the news unfold, I maintain that you have no chance of understanding what's going on on CNN unless you know your Bible. They have not got a clue. They don't even know what an Arab is. <laughs> but you and I have a benefit. You know, everybody know, everybody that's been doing any homework knows that there is a worldwide movement toward a global government. In this country, there's great concern of the subversive aspect of our present administration as they put in place an American police state, as they combine all the federal law enforcement agencies into one. Do your homework on Waco and what really happened there. Find out about the Randy Weaver fiasco and the others. Discover that 52,000 Americans have had their assets confiscated without any charges. 80% of them have never had charges filed, still can't get their assets back after being cleared. What's going on? Constitutional protections are a thing of the past. There's lots of good reasons why this is happening from the point of view of the administration. There is a movement, a subversive movement afoot to destroy the freedoms you and I take for granted. Lots going on. So many people who are following this kind of thing recognize the fingerprints of a world government being put into place, but they fail to understand is the UN probably won't be the structure that most people assume it will be. Why? Because Daniel gives us a clue in Daniel 7 and 2, Daniel 2, chapter 2 and chapter 7, tells a great deal about what's going to happen. And the thing will be Euro-centered. Interesting times in which we live.